I'm here with my friend Tim Sanders. He is a blogger, author, speaker, consultant, strategist, CEO of Deeper Media, and a list of titles that I could keep going on, but if we did that, we would have no time to actually talk to you. So we are really glad to have you back and to talk about specifically some things in sales and how uh, sales leaders can take it up a notch, how they can aim higher and achieve success in, in a faster, better way. Well, thank to you, Skip. really make a difference to their clients, yeah. which is what you're all about. Well, I love to talk about sales. And we just had this fantastic presentation from Tim for the company that I lead, where you just shared so many ideas, uh, my mind hurts. So <laughs> the audience will forgive me as I'm recovering from all the lists of things that we uh, took, that I took down, and I know everybody was taking down things. So thank you for that, Tim. You have all these great books. It started with Love Is the Killer app. Uh, the, the latest one is, is Deal Storming. You have so much information in there, and, and it relates to a lot of things: leadership, strategy, culture, etc. I just want to key in on the sales process okay. uh, for now, just because. Um, just because. No reason. <laughs> Just because. Well, I love sales, Skip. I, I, my first sales job, 1976. 1976, what were you selling? KKQQFM, I sold radio spots. I could see that. Uh, just Very good. walk up and down the street, knock on doors, make little demos on the little cassette. If they liked the demo, they bought an ad. They ran the ad and people came to the store. I got a renewal. If they didn't, I got creative. Well, that is... That's a way to learn sales. That's, That's the hard way, right? That's the hard way. Those were the easy times. Those were the easy times, times man. We didn't have social media to reach out to people. So you didn't. It was uh, you're actually you're actually learning to sell in a different way. Well, take take us in. You've done a lot of research at Deeper Media. You you have extensive personal experience. I'm curious about the mindset. What is the mindset of an exceptional sales leader? What's what are they thinking? What's different about them? How do they approach things differently than either the average salesperson or uh, poor salesperson? What, what is it about them? There's a couple of things about them. <clears throat> the, the first thing is they are intensely curious. Okay, so a salesperson isn't always selling. They're usually listening. So at Deeper Media, we're a research organization. We get hired by companies to look at specific situations, usually in sales. We did a study, and we measured seller word count. And we found out the more you talk, the less you sell, because talking eliminates your ability to ask questions and listen instead. So the mindset of curiosity helps uncover the real problem that the customer is trying to solve, and it helps you develop trust. So that's the first thing is curiosity. The second thing is a commitment to deliver value in every interaction. One of the things I, I counsel people on all the time is don't promise value. Deliver value. So when you go to a meeting, regardless of whatever product you're selling, ask yourself before you walk in the room, what insight am I going to deliver that makes that meeting worth it? In other words, look at what you're going to do in that meeting and ask yourself, in those few moments I talk out of the hour, where's the return on attention for the other side? So that's the second thing. And then finally, the third thing is the mindset is yes. You have, you, have a, you have a question for me, the answer is yes. Might be yes, but. <laughs> yes, but that's going to require a bigger investment. Yes, but that will take more time on implementation, but the answer is yes. Give you a little analogy behind this. Um, John Lennon was once talking about when he met um, Yoko Ono. He completely fell in love with her. I don't know if you heard the story, but a friend had invited John to go to an art uh, installation that Yoko had created, and John didn't want to go. It's not that he didn't like art. He just didn't want to go to some thing he didn't know about. And um, basically, the art installation was just a little ladder that you climb, and on the top of a white ceiling was just this little itty-bitty word. So he climbed up the ladder and looked, and the word was yes. And that's when he fell in love with Yoko Ono. We want to hear yes from people that sell to us. And so what I'm saying here is that we live in a world where the executives we meet with, the last thing they want to hear is that you don't have the power to do something, that you are not willing to do something, that your people are not willing to try something. So we've got to be yes-oriented, sometimes with conditions, and we have to be able to marshal resources inside our own organization because we're not just selling a commodity, we're selling a solution. And a lot of times the solution means that you as a salesperson have a lot of influence with your own company to deliver value. 
Well, that's fantastic. And your story of John Lennon, Yoko uh, Ono is, is particularly interesting to me because I literally just got back from Gibraltar where they got married in a hotel. Oh, wow. So it's cool. pretty cool Small experience. world, right? Yeah, small world. And, and for those people who are listening to the podcast or watching this video, we interviewed restaurateur Cameron Mitchell. Oh, yeah. And his book is, yeah. you know, the answer is yes. Their whole company's built on the answer is yes. And then figure it out and how you're going to deliver. So that's great. Going back to the first one, Tim, you started off with curiosity. Mm -hmm. Can you develop curiosity or are you naturally just curious or not? So, so if I'm an average salesperson, I want to be exceptional, I may, you know, I may not be curious. How, how do I develop that or can I develop that kind of innate ability to ask questions and become more curious? I think curiosity gets beat out of us. It's sort of like creativity. <laughs> I mean, think about a kid. It's true. What's a kid's favorite question? Why? They ask why. Because they're strangers in a new world and they're trying to make sense of it all, right? Curiosity is not just an emotion. Um, it's a, an adaptation mechanism for kids. And over the course of time, um, the ego blossoms and we perceive being curious um, as not knowing something and to need to learn something. And so we don't do it. And I, I truly believe it's, uh, Dr. Sir Ken Robinson would say schools kind of beat curiosity and creativity out of us, but I believe that we are all born with an equal level of curiosity. I think uh, as a young child, it is your strongest emotion. It is more developed than fear or happiness for a child. And then as we become an adult, we become less curious. And the reason we become less curious is we become more comfortable with our situation. And we become more sure of ourselves. And we become more, I'm doing air quotes here for those listening, more educated. Um, so we lack the humility as life goes on to be curious. Kids are humble. Have you ever met a four-year-old and you say, you know the problem with that four-year-old, he's just not down to earth. <laughs> he's got a big ego. It's very rare. Kids are humble because they know their place. And I think sometimes we need to know our place. So if a salesperson doesn't know what she doesn't know and they go into meetings saying first and foremost, I'm a curious person that needs to develop a much richer understanding of not only my customer, but the context that he or she does business in, that humility is going to go a long ways. It really will. I, I love, you were talking about the three words. I, I use them all the time. Tell me more. Mm -hmm. It's just so powerful that people open up. Yep. Uh, I remember when I was in law school, I was I was uh, fascinated. We, th we saw this, this one woman who was always asking questions. And sometimes people would think, those are dumb questions. And, and the pressure was to not ask the questions. And so it was that same thing. It gets beat out of us. And at the very end of the year, I realized they published everyone's great. She was the number one student. Mm. Well, she was asking the questions that, you know, she just wasn't afraid to ask the questions. Yeah. She was innately curious. Yeah. And it just struck me. It changed me in a way to yeah. just say, you know what? I'm just not going to be afraid to ask these questions. They may be dumb questions, but they're my questions. So oh, I love that. It's Sam great. Walton had a saying. He said, curiosity doesn't kill the cat, it kills the competition. Mm. Walmart was based on questions. Sam Walton went around the country. Lord Taylor is an example, one up in New Hampshire, where he would just ask questions like, what do you do when you save money in a supplier negotiation? That was a key question that created the, the birth of Walmart. And, and that famous retailer said, well, when we do uh, see a windfall, we put it in our pocket. It's a rare day. And that's when he realized, well, it really should flow through to the customer. And by asking questions of existing retailers, he found his opportunity to disrupt retailing, right? Nice. But I think what Sam understood, and as I kind of nerded out a little bit in studying curiosity, is there's two types of curiosity. So while he says curiosity doesn't kill the cat, there is a bad kind of curiosity and there's a good kind of curiosity. Sort of like how pride has two sides, right? So the good side of curiosity um, is um, epistemal, epistemic curiosity, purpose-driven curiosity, the desire to learn something the desire to understand. So, so epistemic curiosity is very healthy for us. It helps us grow as people. Um, diversive curiosity, though, is um, solving boredom. Now, kids have both, right? So, so the kid wants to learn where they are, and once they get comfortable, they want to solve boredom. That's why they remain curious. It's the boredom solving that gets us in trouble in life. So we need to be very purposeful and have a goal for curiosity, especially in the sales situation. And one of the things that I just recently read a study on is that the difference between selling to um, an, like a non-executive person, let's call it an administrator, and selling to a senior executive is you don't get to ask 
obvious questions to senior executives. As a matter of fact, mm. the more obvious questions you should have already had answers for you asked to a senior executive, the less likely you are to ever see them again or do a deal with them. So, so you have true. to be smart about questions. You need to ask questions only they can answer. That is so true. Right? So one of the things I do with one of my consulting clients is we now have a, 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 an insight group of analysts, and all they do is create customer briefings from the outside to give you a deep knowledge of the company. So the kind of questions you ask are next level questions. And by, because you understand all the obvious points anybody from the outside should know about your company, these questions become much more probing. They kind of follow up on public knowledge, and they demonstrate um, not just a curiosity, but an intellectual curiosity that is very engaging to senior executives. That, that is a definite skill, and I can speak from personal experience. A big mistake a lot of salespeople make uh, approaching me is sometimes they'll be like, well, tell me a little bit about you, you know, blah, blah, yeah, blah. Yeah. Tell and me I'm about like, OCLC, really? Yes. You, you didn't Google you us, yeah. you didn't read about the company, yeah. you don't know my LinkedIn profile yeah. or anything, Like, and, and I'm going to do that for you now? Yeah. I don't think so, right? It just immediately just makes me shut down. So and I, I tell so you an good. easy way to so open good. up you. So let's do the situation. So instead of coming in, they sit down and they say, Skip, tell me about your company, tell me about what keeps you up at night, all the obvious questions that, if I came in and said, well, well Skip, you know, I saw that, I saw that you did this uh, speech at ALA, and uh, around four minutes into the speech, uh, you talked a little bit about the shifting priorities of librarianism, and you talked a little bit more about, you know, we need to focus on community engagement instead of object management. Unpack that a little bit more for me. I'm curious. I got your attention now. I've Absolutely. done my homework. You've done your homework, you're engaging, you're curious. I'm, I'm And totally by the way, in. the answer you give me about librarianism, about what community engagement is, is something that's very near and dear to your heart. That's going to make me very smart about the future of librarianism if I'm going to sell to your space. So that's just an example. So one little tip I give people is like it's a curious salesperson scours Google for relevant information before the meeting and the questions are geared to give them deeper understanding but at the same time show that they're committed to do their homework. Well, you were talking about delivering value and you, were, you had this juxtapositioning of, of listening and asking questions and then delivering value at you know at a certain point at the right time yeah, yeah. And at the end of the meeting the when you've earned it meeting. yeah when you've earned, earned it and and yet and i remember uh, neil rackham i i had yeah, I love him, him spin selling spin selling right yeah. classic and i hired him once and he was working with my leadership team at another organization and he said something that i'll never forget every client sales presentation you want it to be so good that they will write a check that they would write a check for the value that you just have, for the meeting. Right? So it's that same concept. Yeah. But the inherent kind of thought people think is, well, then if I'm going to deliver this value, I've got to come in with all the answers with this. And so it's talk, talk, talk. And you're saying, no, it's got to be reversed. So how do you deliver that value? You know, that That's a very hard balance, I think, for a lot of people to learn to, to listen, ask these questions, but then also deliver the value at the end. How do you do that? Because most people want, well, in order to deliver the value, I need to prepare my slides, prepare my information, and then vomit it all over everybody, right? Because that's what they're thinking. Yeah. But how do you how do you teach that? How do you get because that it's doesn't seem like a natural thing to do. You develop the skill, right? You can't coach speed in sports, but you can absolutely coach technique, right? So so the, the best the best people in sports aren't always the fastest. They're they're the most studious, okay? Um, one, of my, uh, one of my buddies at ADP, big payroll company, sales leader there, he says every single day you got to coil a spring. you got to coil that spring. Intellectually. Coil that spring. You've got to coil that spring. And what he means by it is that you've got to become a deep student of the game. And you've got to study the customer's problems from their point of view. You have to develop insights by grasping the problem space that they live in every day. You need to get up... I was thinking about it yesterday. You've got to get up and study it. I study collaboration, which is my passion right now. I study it two hours a day, no joke. Mm. It's the first 45 minutes of my day. It's the last hour to hour and 15 minutes. And what I mean by this, Skip, is I'm digging in and I'm reading or I'm interviewing someone, not for content, but for clarity. And I'm calling somebody who's an expert on collaboration or they've done, they're part of a study. Like I just interviewed a guy from Nielsen. I, uh, I'm, I'm now passionate about interviewing um, Susan Palmer uh, from the Ohio Five, for example, to get deeper and deeper to understand the consortium thinking, right? And every day I'm coiling that spring, I'm tightening it up because I'm continuing to study. Because the more time and effort you put towards understanding a problem space or understanding an opportunity, 
the more richer your information skill set becomes. So that when I'm in a fluid situation and we're talking at the end of the meeting and I've been curious and I've asked questions, a lot of things click for me. And at the end of the meeting, I can customize like a tailor a piece of advice to you based on all of the legwork I've done day Before. in and day out around my passion area and the salesperson that would be their subject area. So where I deliver something to you where you go, wow, why am I not hearing this from my own people? And the answer is there's a huge difference between people that quail the spring every day and people that quail the spring once a year or when there's a crisis. Well said. And you gave me a great answer because sometimes people will tell me, my wife in particular, Skip, you're, you're wound tight. You're wound too tight. You need to relax. And now just say, I'm coiling the spring. I'm coiling <laughs> That's the spring, the man. Answer. Coiling yeah. the spring, Thank you for man. that. So you're studying collaboration and you're an expert in collaboration. Deal storming is a lot about collaborating across an organization, yeah. uh, both internally and externally, yeah. to, uh, to, to achieve a result. I'd love for you to just tell us a little bit more about what you're, what, what, what currently top of mind about collaboration? You're reading studies, you've done your own studies. Uh, what, what can we take away from your studies on collaboration? So over almost 10 years I've been on this journey. And I got really interested in collaboration early in my career. I worked for Dr. Edward Deming, who was one of the leaders of the quality movement. Collaboration was the secret uh, for the Japanese in reducing variance in manufacturing, being able to work together across the lines of an organization courageously. So I got very curious about it over time. But about 10 years ago, it's like, it's funny, it started with the definition of collaboration. If you look up the dictionary definition of collaboration and then expand on it a little bit, I would tell you collaboration is the act of two or more people working together with a shared vision, co-creating solutions. Co-creating. Co-creating solutions. Collaboration is not the same thing as cooperation. Cooperation is when I procure information from another party, but I still own the problem. And I begin to study the difference between cultures that cooperate and cultures that collaborate. It became profound. So one of the first insights I took away from it was the importance of co-creation. That if I'm truly going to, quote, collaborate with someone, I must work with them on equal footing. I've got to recognize their strengths. I've got to give them a voice at the table. I've got to give them a voice in the solution. And whatever we do, they got to, we got to agree on something we can all live with. So that was like phase one of me in collaboration. Then phase two became diversity of thought. Uh, first, I began to read research around the four humors in Greek mythology. I call it the Beatles effect, right? Without Ringo, it's not the Beatles. It's just wings with a special guest appearance by John Lennon, right? <laughs> nice. So there's this diversity of thought that leads to everything. And then after um, getting to know the guys at Corporate Executive Board, Deeper Media did our first big panel study where we took a look at almost 200 situations where corporations had created teams to solve a problem, whatever it is. Uh, get a new product out the door, deal with a customer crisis, uh, figure out how to afford something for an acquisition. And we begin to study the effectiveness of a 90-minute meeting. How often do they walk out of the room with the next play that actually moves the needle? And what we found is that the magic number is four perspectives. If you have a single perspective, say a siloed way of thinking, just the sales growth mentality, the success rate was only 20%. When sales started to work with the second group, could be any group, marketing, operations, finance, delivery, their number goes up to 30%. They had a third perspective, third way of seeing the world. Maybe it's the customer's perspective. They got to 40%, but the magic number was four. Those teams that had four ways of seeing the world, which could be departmental, they could be disciplinary, they could be the lines between company, supplier, customer, they could be generational, millennial, geezer, they could be demographic, adding gender mix or even all, all ethnic mix to the context. When they got to four unique perspectives, 80% of the time they walked out with the next play that made a difference. So that was phase two. That's okay? fantastic. What, right? what power of diversity right there. I'm always talking about it because at first, at first, it slows you down because you you know everybody's thinking one way, but you always end up with a better answer. Oh, but yeah. it takes time to understand it. But once you do, it's it's amazing. I've seen it. It's like, wow, the impact when you listen to that that third or fourth voice. That's great. But it's it, four. Here's, I wouldn't have known it was four. Yeah, the magic number is four. Uh, by the way, there's. Um, eight archetypal perspectives in an organizational mindset. So even inside your own company, even if you don't work with customers or suppliers, you can get eight perspectives around the table. Think about it. It's like sales and marketing have a growth perspective. Uh, uh, operations has a scale perspective. Marketing has a voice of the market perspective and so on. So there's eight archetypal, archetypal perspectives you can draw on. Again, not even counting the other ways you can do it. 
perspective is a story that we tell ourselves about how the world works. And if you get more stories, especially if they are diverse, you solve blind spots. Patterns are recognized and noticed that we can't see because we're so stuck in our fishbowl. If you ask the fish, how's the water? The fish would say, what water? You know what I mean? So the power of perspective is really important. And where I'm at right now, and what I'm super passionate about now with collaboration is neural synchronization. Tell us more about that. Face to face. So I believe that the only effective way to collaborate is like how you and I are sitting across the table from each other right now, looking each other in the eye, or over video conferencing. Not through text message? No, you, Slack email. is not a collaboration tool. Slack is an email management tool. We think it's a collaboration tool. No, we do not effectively collaborate verbally. We don't collaborate well over email. We don't collaborate over written word. We do not collaborate very well over conference call. Specifically, one of the things I'm trying to stomp out is poor collaboration because of the dependency on conference calls. Conference calls are an absolute waste of our time. Every week, I do a maximum of one or two, but I'll do 15 to 20 Zooms a week. Neural synchronization is studied by Stanford University. What they've learned is that we look at each other, like even you, like you and I. How many times during this conversation are you and I going to look each other right in the eye? And we're reading each other's face, but what we don't know we're doing is we're synchronizing. Mm. Right? So getting back to the Beatles, one of the things the Beatles did that made them so very special from a live performance, made people just go gaga over them, is they nodded when they sang. I want you to go back and look at footage of Paul and John and, and Ringo yeah, and George, and they're all singing and they're nodding. That's synchronization. That's neural synchronization at its primally best. And it was one of those things that they didn't even know they were doing. But anyway, I, I become passionate mm -hmm. about people developing, developing video proficiency. I do understand we can't always be face-to-face. -face. It's not always possible, but we can do video. There's absolutely no excuse. Maybe we're worried that it's hard, or that we don't look good, or that we can't figure it out, or we can't convince the other side to do it. I believe the skill set of the future, not just for sales, but for leadership, is your ability to communicate by video, either live as you collaborate or problem solve or coach, or as you produce your content. I believe that's the future of everything. That's fantastic. And I if you don't believe me, just look at any social media feed and see what people pay attention to, just the video. Videos. Video. It grabs your attention. What about that? So you, you mentioned future skills. So picking up on that, future skills for people in sales, but in leadership, what other things would you, would you consider important? So mastery of video, what else? Um, so um, I think of um, being able to study the opposite. I don't know if you've ever seen the television show Stranger Things. Yes, okay. of course. It, it, mastering the upside down is really, really important. So in sales, you have to ask yourself, or in your industry, you have to ask yourself, or in your department, you have to ask yourself, what is the exact opposite way of seeing the world? And, st and learn how to study it. And you develop more um, nimbleness in your mind. You develop the ability to um, tolerate um, abstraction and ambiguity, which is the secret to all creativity, starting with a blank canvas. I think the problem for us is when we think about studentship, we think about it so deeply within our silo of excellence. So we think, well, if I want to be a better salesperson, I need to study sales. And I'm like, no, you should study buying. And I don't mean studying the mind of the buyer. Learn how to buy. Learn, like in your industry. What do they care about? Yeah, I mean, it's like. How do they do it? If I, if I, were, if I were in your industry, I would, I would become just curious to a fault about studying consortium mindset. Like why do, why do small universities work together at the library level? I'd want to know that. So, so if you sell, study how people buy. As a matter of fact, I had a buddy who worked at Target years ago and he went on to do Toys R Us, but it's not his fault what happened at Toys R Us, it was Amazon's fault. But, but he began to study how people shopped without trying to jump ahead and say, well, that means this is the way we should merchandise. And they begin to study great writers like Paco Underhill, who had you know, thousands of hours of footage just watching how people shop. His ability to reverse how do we sell, to study instead how do they buy, greatly expanded his perspectives, unleashed his creativity, and gave him a lot more confidence. One of the things that Mark Cuban, who I worked for for a couple of years, one of the things he did is he talked about um, edge-level curiosity. Edge level. Edge level curiosity. So he takes the he says you take the core thing that you care about and you only study that twenty five percent of the time. Seventy five percent you study at the edges. Mm -hmm. So if he was really into tech, he said, What's the edges of tech? Well, people management was one of the edges of tech. He really got adept at that. 
became pretty important to him later as a leader. Um, at the edge of tech uh, was brand and position because tech was quickly becoming a way to differentiate yourself. So we started to study marketing and branding and position. Uh, a big part of the edge of tech was affordability and cost of ownership. So we started to study finance, which led him to study the stock market, which led to him becoming a billionaire. So what he, what he, what he told me is this great story. He said he read a story about um, uh, LBJ, President, President Johnson. And, you know, President Johnson had a lot of land in Texas. So this cub, cub reporter for Time was doing a, a profile. It was like a big opportunity for him to come out and, 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 and interview Lyndon. And so he asked LBJ, he says, so this is your farm. And LBJ says, yeah, you know, it's here. And it goes to this edge over here and goes to the edge over here. And I just bought this and I just bought that. And I got a bid in to buy this. And so the guy says, well, how much land do you want to own? And he says, well, I just want to own what you see right here and everything around it. <laughs> and that was what Mark thought about in terms of learning, that you always have to kind of get out of your, your, core, your core area of emphasis and start studying at the edges because it leads you to more edges. And all of a sudden, you develop a much more holistic view about how the world works, and you have the opportunity to blossom into a trusted advisor, which kind of takes us back to sales. One of the books I recommend people on the podcast to listen to, I love this book, it's called Selling to the C-Suite. And it talks about the path of sales proficiency. So we start out as a commodity supplier, and we're good at smiling and dialing and taking orders. We kind of move up and become a problem solver. And then we become a person who delivers value because we know how to marshal resources at home with our own company. And some point in our career, we become a trusted advisor. And it's a great leap. But the great leap comes from that edge-level curiosity, that passionate desire to continue to learn, not just the stuff that you do, but as LBJ would say, everything around it. That's great. And I'm a student that way of people who become trusted advisors and always perpetually learning. I think people who listen and watch and read this blog, podcast, video, however they're taking it in, are also students, are yeah. also trying to keep bettering themselves and learning these edges. So that is powerful. That's a great way to end because uh, you're always pushing the envelope of all these things. That's why if we ask you about sales or leadership or strategy, wherever I come at, you have all of this other perspective in this because you're also always pushing those edges. So thank you for doing that oh, for skip. all of thank us. You, we appreciate it. And uh, I think that all of us want to become better trusted advisors, trusted advisors. Yeah. I like that too. It's not just an advisor. Yeah. You have to be trusted. You know, and I think a lot about what it takes to be, you know, not just trusted, but like essential essential partner. That's what I want to be. You know, I want to be a person that others can't do business without. And I don't mean that from an egotistical standpoint. I mean, I believe our only barrier to entry from the competition is, is to become essential. So much value that they see you in a different light. And you know what else from a human standpoint? It allows us to make a greater impact with people. You know, I wrote about this in Love is a Killer app that, you know, when I was writing that book, I, I happened to read The Art of Happiness by the Dalai Lama. It was like a random read, but I wanted to read a book on the psychology of satisfaction. Okay, so the art of happiness seemed to kind of fit into it. The Dalai Lama said happiness is the absence of negative thought. That blew my mind. But there's a thing he said in the book that really impacts the way I see the world. And he said that if, if you live your life right, and, and you add, he didn't say add value, but he said if you live your life right and do enough for people. He said at the twilight of your life, you get to look back on the whole thing and you get to enjoy it a second time. So a lot of times when I talk about being a trusted advisor or being an essential partner or being a teacher to other people, what I really mean is that when I was a little kid, I wanted to change the world. And I've really never given up that goal. And I believe no matter what we do, even sales, we can absolutely change people's lives in a profound way that when we're all pushing you know, chairs around in Boca Raton in our 90s, we can look back and say, man, when you were an account executive and I was a corporate buyer, we rocked. And we can feel really good about what we did. Well, if you ever listen to this and you're in Boca and you're in your 90s or on the way, yeah. you will know that if you find him there in his 90s someday, you will have found the original love cat. So thank you so much for this. And we appreciate the conversation. And we will continue to have a dialogue. And every time I get to see you, I know I'm going to have more ideas. So thanks so much, Tim. Awesome, Skip. Thank you.